My friends, Easter is too much for just one day. Easter is too meaningful for even just a season that we set aside every year. Easter is too transformational to limit it to any measure of time. And so we gather together again today, a week after Easter, mindful of that truth that properly received and understood Easter has an ongoing, daily, lifelong promise of transformational power over our lives. So we still declare Christ is risen and we still respond, he is risen indeed. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's stand together for our opening hymn. remain standing for our responsive litany. At the end of each phrase I read, I'll say Christ is risen, and then I'll gesture to you and you'll say he is risen indeed. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. May this declaration resound not only in these walls, but touch the lives of all we meet and forever be the truth of which we speak. We raise a hallelujah, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. God's love, once sown within a garden, tended for God's people, now spreads in this place and wherever it is shown. I raise a hallelujah, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. For new and abundant life that comes with every resurrection of love, I raise a hallelujah, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Amen.
seated. Well, good morning and welcome to worship at Wyzetta Community Church. We are in a season where we have to ask and answer the question whether we think our way into new ways of acting or if we act our way into new ways of thinking. Now, I think, happen to think it's also a bit of a false dichotomy. I think there are seasons of life when one is more appropriate than the other. But our thinking has been so jumbled up in the last year. And we, we've had to think about everything before we do it, right? And even that thinking hasn't been clear and easy. But as we're going to focus on this morning in our worship theme of, of being after something, after Easter, um, our hope and prayer is that we're moving into a phase that is after the pandemic, right? So we have to, we have to start thinking and acting and acting and thinking differently. Well, worship is one way in which, clearly, we're acting our way into new ways of thinking. There are just some things that we have had to do. We've had to act in some ways that, that make us think differently about things. Now, we're gathering together in person safely. We ask you to wear masks. We expect you to wear masks. We expect you to keep distance from people in other households. Um, but other than that, we believe that we can act safely, that we can be doing this in safe ways because we've thought a lot through it. So we're here at 8, 9, 10.30 on Sunday mornings in person. 10 a.m. is parables online. Wednesday night also, uh, by the way, at 6.30. It's a wonderful midweek experience. Uh, Wednesday night and the services other than parables um, all share the same theme and scripture and, and message. We just want you to know that. Not a different message Wednesday to Sunday. But all that adds up to us acting into new ways of thinking. I mean, things are different in the space here with their cameras on tripods around the room that weren't here before, you know, a year ago because we've had to start acting differently. Now, some of that's going to go away in time, but not yet. There are things like screens on walls that weren't there before. But again, all of this is part of what it means to be acting and thinking differently. We really don't have a whole lot of choice except to trust right, and go into it that way, and look at you, you're here, and it's been a great morning, and last Sunday was an amazing Easter, it was a great day of celebration, so we're moving into that season, and I hope you'll just continue to just move with us as people of faith, we act on faith, we don't live uh, by sight alone, now one of those ways in which we're doing things a little differently also has to do with our annual meeting, uh, that'll be two weeks from yesterday, so I'm supposed to notify you of that meeting. Glad to do so. It's a nice tradition in our congregational way of doing things. But it'll be on Zoom again this year, and we moved it to a Saturday so we didn't have to rush through important business. We're going to elect two new leaders. Meg Good, who's the current vice moderator, is going to become the next moderator. Uh, an, a wonderful longtime member of the church, John Hallberg, is going to be elected as our next vice moderator. Uh, those are the, the two lay leaders of the church. And there'll be other important topics discussed. I think at this point in time, we have no fewer than three search committees actively at work right now. It's time to rebuild the staff after what has been, as it has been in many places of life, a time of stepping away for, for people. But now it's time to start bringing them back. And so that's all underway, and that's all part of that annual meeting, and that's all important. Um, but again, it's all part of the same theme and the same experience of the ways that we think and that we act. I also just want to let you know that there's a really important thing that's happening that is, again, doing something differently because of the way we've changed our thinking uh, around mission giving. If you haven't heard about Doe yet, I'd invite you to get to our website and read all about it. Because for my money and for my way of thinking, dough is one of the most exciting and transformational things that Wayzata Community Church is up to right now. So be mindful of that and attentive to that as, as, we, go into, uh, as we go into this season. The final thing I, that I just want to say is every time we gather like this, we can expect, and I, I'd say for the next several months, whenever we gather like that, there's going to be someone in the room who's back for the first time in a long time. 
And some of you I know are here today for the first time in a long time. And I know for me when it happened, it was really emotional. Like just being in the space was emotional. It, it, it made me kind of vulnerable. And when I heard that first musical instrument, and when I heard people, their voices in this space, it was overwhelming. My encouragement is just to be careful. Be full of care for yourselves, for yourself as an individual, but also for the people around you. Because these are unique and they're sacred times. God is at work among us. Um, and uh, and it's, it's going to be an ongoing delight to be able to just be alongside one another as we continue along this journey of faith. So I'm glad you're here this morning. We're going to have an offertory anthem right now, but we're not going to pass the plates. We'd invite you to continue to support the church with an online uh, gift, or there are plates at the door as you go out if, you, if that is still the way you prefer to do it. But again, in many of the ways that we're acting and thinking our way through this whole venture of faith. So let us then uh, continue your worship with uh, generous uh, spirit uh, and generous lives as we continue in worship together. be seated. Well, our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John. This is actually the first of two after stories that John tells about Jesus appearing to the disciples. We're going to look at one this week and the second next week. So here now, this first after story from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, 
and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Well, I remember first hearing about and learning about the afters when I was a senior in, or when I was in high school. Um, and I remember specifically that it was a, a post-Easter sermon series by the senior minister at the time, but he was giving this advice based on a longtime friend of his who, who had the nickname The Toad. And um, the, this advice came in the form of a collection of prayers and poems that uh, the Toad, or Mr. Toad, whose real name was Kenny Krause, had written over the years. A bunch of really great, insightful uh, thoughts. And among them was the admonition to mind your afters. To mind the afters. To pay attention to the afters of life. And here I am, um, you know, 40 years later, still thinking about this. The afters um, are those times in life immediately following noteworthy experiences. We don't plan for the afters. They just come as a matter of course, right? They look different for all of us. My afters are different than your afters, but we experience them in similar ways. Some afters are daily, like after work or after school, or my favorite, after dinner. I love that time after dinner, especially, you know, when the, some of the family's hanging around, like, don't touch those dishes. Leave them right where they are. We're going to hang out for a while. We call it forced family fun at our house. <laughs> Afters are also seasonal, right? It's like that time after summer when we all just... Weep openly every day thinking about winter that's coming, you know. Um, but life is seasonal also. The afters are seasonal because we lose friends and loved ones on a regular basis. This past week we celebrated the life of Bill Baxter. And so his wife Shirley and their family are in a season after, right? Today's the Sunday after Easter. And as I said at the top of the service, we're in a season, we all pray to God every day, that is after this pandemic. So we do well to attend to these afters. I think in the afters, we, we come to know ourselves in new ways. Because I think in the afters, we are vulnerable, we're more open and aware. Because it's a, it's a marginal space of life. It's, it's actually not structured like everything else is. So we are spending today and next Sunday in the afters, according to John's gospel, um, the text that Danielle just read. And as we turn to that, though, let's ask for God's blessing on that passage and on our lives. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious and loving God, speak to us as a gift of your spirit about the afters. Speak to us through this word of yours that it might become ours. Amen. So there was a young boy who had a nickname. That nickname was Sparky. But in this case, the little boy didn't really like that nickname much because it was always followed by two more words, the loser. Sparky the Loser, nice nickname, huh? Well, 
I mean, candidly, the kid sort of earned it because <laughs> he was a bit of a failure. He was Sparky the loser. He failed in the classroom by flunking out of eighth grade. He failed in sports, even though he made the golf team one time. He cost the team a championship along the way. Socially, he wasn't so much a loser as Sparky was just kind of a non-existent personality. And in middle school and high school, that can be a pretty brutal reality, right? But Sparky had a hobby. He had a really uh, good gift, uh, a talent in being able to draw, to do like cartoons in particular. And it seemed that he had promise until Sparky was uh, rejected by his own high school yearbook as a cartoonist. Sparky the loser kept on drawing though because it was how he could express himself. And he thought he would enter into a contest that was being offered by this guy named uh, Walter. Last name was uh, Disney. So Walt Disney was holding this contest for cartoonists like you know, to, to get more animators in, in their company. And so the contest was to draw a guy fixing a clock by just shoveling all the parts back into it. So Sparky did his cartoon of this, sent it off, and no response came. Until several weeks later, an envelope arrived with Sparky's name on the front and a funny-looking mouse on the back, so he knew what it was and took it up to his room, as most of us would in a nervous moment, off to his private room where he just kind of held the envelope, knowing that his destiny may lie within. And as he tore it open and began to read, he didn't have to finish the letter because the five, first five words were, we regret to inform you. Sparky, the loser. His life became somewhat of a cartoon in and of itself. Funny enough that he began telling his own story with his cartoons, and you lifelong Minnesotans already know exactly who Sparky was. He began drawing cartoons of a kid who just couldn't quite succeed at much of anything. Pictures and balloon texts of a boy with his friends living a childhood full of misadventures, a chronic underachiever whose kite never flies, who never gets to kick the football, and whose dog won't even listen to him. Sparky the Loser, of course, Charles Monroe Schultz, also known as Charlie Brown. Sparky the Loser. Hmm. I tell you this long story because I need you to be in touch with the last time that you failed. I know, I'm sure you got up this morning and said, man, I can't wait to get to church and think about what a failure I am. But you're going to have to trust me for a few minutes, okay? It matters. If you can just recall a time when, when you failed, preferably a pretty good failure, a pretty big flop, if you can think of one. And I need you to be in, in touch with that While you're thinking about yours, I, it's easy for me to call up some of mine just over the years. I, I remember failing so many tests in seventh grade, math tests, I should say. I failed so many math tests in seventh grade that my teacher got in trouble. Uh, I remember uh, being the goalie my senior year in high school, a hockey team, and near the end of the season when you keep playing if you keep winning, right? Puck was shot from the far end of the ice, I thought for sure it was going to be an icing, so I just kind of stepped aside, let that puck go right by me. It kicked up on its edge and curled right into the goal. Game over. I mean, I still remember that. I remember being turned away not once, not twice, but three times by the Lilly Endowment for a fund that I needed to take a sabbatical with my family for a long time ago. Eventually I got that. But I remember those failures along the way. But more importantly than anything, and again, this is why I ask you, I remember how I felt after 
each of those failures. Can you remember how you felt after you failed? You know, because losing sticks with us, doesn't it? It it sticks with us more than our successes ever do. You know, those folks down in Augusta right now are playing a bunch of golf, right? I remember not too long ago, Phil Mickelson was sort of the one um, that got teased quite a bit because he never could quite win that tournament. And a cartoon was drawn of Phil Mickelson, and underneath it, it said, if at first you don't succeed, try, 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 try again. You know, because other people help us remember our failures. That, that's another part of what's kind of hard about it. They stick to us, not only because we remember how we felt, but because other people tend to remind us how we felt. I'm reminded of a man and his wife who went to his 20-year high school reunion, and after the party was over, he went out with a buddy, an old buddy, and they were out all night partying, and the next day he came home, he was in real trouble with his wife. When he saw his friend later in the day, he said, man, when I got home this morning, my wife got all historical on me. His friend said, you mean she, got, she was hysterical, right? He said, no, historical. She reminded me of every single thing I ever did wrong in my whole life. And is Garrison Keillor, another character out of Minnesota history, right? Garrison Keillor, who would remind us that we always have a backstage view of ourselves. And that oftentimes includes the truth of our own failures along the way. Do you remember a failure in your own life? Do you remember what was happening? And do you remember how you felt after? Because to fully understand this relatively unremarkable passage of Scripture that Danielle just read, to understand it is to understand the mindset of the characters in it, the mindset of the disciples in that room behind locked doors, how they felt. Because that was a room full of sparkies. It was a room full of flunkies and failures. Each of them had failed in some way. They had either failed God or they failed Jesus. They failed each other or themselves. You could take a roll call of the people in that room based on the stories of failure that each one of them represented. But the good news for them and the good news for us is that they could not keep Jesus out. No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't keep Jesus out of that room any more than the tomb could keep Jesus in. When in fact, all they really did in locking themselves behind that door was to lock themselves in, trapped in their own misery in their own recollections of failure. And don't we do the same thing way, way, way too often? But the good news is Jesus breaks through those barriers. He breaks through every locked door. He comes into every room that we run to to hide in. And he gives us the greatest gift Right in the midst of our lostness and the midst of our losing, he gives us the greatest gift we can receive, and that is simply the gift of hope. Especially in the afters of failure. We can hang the whole hope of our lives on the one who meets us in that place and assures us that there's more for us to do. In this, in this brief passage, in just these few verses, Jesus gives the gift of hope in the form of peace and purpose and power. How does he give them the hope of peace? Well, he spoke it right out to them. In John's gospel, three times in two post-resurrection visits, Jesus starts by saying, peace be with you. 
right? And it's not just any old kind of peace. He says, peace be with you. My peace I give to you. That's the very same peace that we pass, well, or used to pass, among us in this service. It's a very real and tangible peace. And the Greek word for peace means literally, it's okay. You are okay. It, it's peace in the form of, of affirmation. And his presence is that affirmation in action. Not just saying it, but showing up. It's okay. You are okay. And in this moment, Jesus models uh, the best of what Carlisle Marnie calls balcony people. I've talked about balcony people in the past. Remember what balcony people are? Balcony people. Here's a, here's a quick summary of it. All around a sphere of clear air in our conscious minds runs a balcony. And that balcony is filled with people who are not merely sitting up there, but practically hanging over the edge, cheering us on. Balcony people. Isn't that a great, beautiful image? A bunch of people hanging over the failures of our lives, saying to us, it's okay. You are okay. Peace. Peace be with you. I hope you know who the balcony people are in your life. I hope you can look up and, and just imagine, see their faces. Take time today. Thank them for that. And if they're already gone, lift a prayer of gratitude to God. And then go and be a balcony person for someone else. Because it brings peace. It brings the same peace that Jesus brought the disciples that, that night. Peace be with you. So there's hope in peace there's hope also in purpose this purpose gives form and function to the peace and the affirmation jesus gave him a job to do i love this he gave him a job and with that job came purpose jesus said just as the father sent me so i send you oh and by the way remember this is a room full of flunkies there's a bunch of sparkies and Jesus said, hey, just as the Father sent me, and you guys all kind of screwed it up, I still send you. And what was the primary purpose in the passage today? Do you remember what it said? It said to go and do something. He sends them to forgive The centrality of forgiveness in a life of faith can't be overstated. It was one of our ways in which we saw love during Lent. Love looked like forgiveness one week. And a life without purpose is a life hard to lead. A life without forgiveness is impossible to live. So for today, I would invite you to also consider, aside from the balcony people, about the ways in which you need to receive and to give peace, What forgiveness do you need to give? What forgiveness do you need to receive? Because just like it was the disciples' job, it was their purpose, and there was hope in that, so it is for us. There is hope in that purpose of forgiveness. But Jesus didn't stop there. He granted them hope in peace. He gave them hope in purpose. But then he also gave them hope in a power source. Peace, purpose, and power What was the power? The text puts it this way. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, when Danielle and I are up here praying or preaching, we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. That's just not not fancy words. It's the whole point of the Holy Spirit. It's the manifestation of God and Christ post-Easter, after Easter, What we've been given is this ongoing power source that we call the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says to receive it. Not just accept it, but to receive this gift. I always 
love telling people the difference between accepting something and receiving it. You, do you know that? Do you know the difference between accepting something, receiving it? I accept asparagus, <laughs> but I receive apple pie. Right? And, and this idea of it being breathed into us. It just, it fills us up and it gives us the breath of life. Even the ability, the capacity to stand up and live another day. We have been given the hope of power in the spirit that says you do not go alone. And Jesus sends the Holy Spirit upon his disciples. He sends the spirit upon us. And will we be ready to receive it? Can we hear that good word of hope? Most especially when we're locked away in a room for fear or for failure, can we still tap into and plug in to that gift of power in its purest form? What did it look like outside when you got here? I've been inside all morning. What's the sky look like? Is it kind of cloudy? Is it gloomy? Hey, Wardo, how's it look outside right now? Is it cloudy? Yeah? Yeah. So, you know what? I'm good with that. Because without a day like today, we can't appreciate the glory of a beautiful bluebird sky with the sun showering over us. You can't appreciate success without failure right? You can't appreciate sunshine without clouds. You can't appreciate light without dark. You can't appreciate joy without pain. And again, you cannot appreciate success without some failure. But how do we measure success? In a venture of faith that isn't measured by profit margins or bottom lines or anything that's measurable, countable? How do, we, how do we measure success in this endeavor of following Jesus? Well, at least one way that we can measure it is the simple fact that here we are, 2,000 years later. And not by accident, but because there were 11 losers locked behind a door through which came the loving presence of God in a risen Christ who gave them hope in peace and purpose and in power. When Charles Schultz died in 2000, an elementary-aged girl wrote about him. She said, Charles Schultz died but his work still appears in newspapers around the world, so he lives on through the characters he created and loved. And so it is with us. Christ lives on in the characters that he created and loves in you and in me. And speaking of nicknames like the Toad and Sparky the Loser... There's another nickname that we all share. The nickname of Christian. My favorite definition of Christian is little Christs. We all get to be little Christs. And living up to that nickname is going to have something to do with peace and purpose and power. So speaking on Christ's behalf, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Amen.
please join me now in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful that when you show up, you show up bringing peace. And we're thankful, God, that again and again we see these pictures of Jesus arriving in very difficult and painful circumstances. And the first thing he says every time is, peace be with you. So we receive that peace this morning, O oh God, and we pray that it will seep into every area of our lives, that where we are broken, you will bring us peace. Where we are confused, you will bring your peace. And where we wonder what next steps we are called to take into new life with you, we ask for your peace to lead the way in our decision making, in the ways that we serve others and love others. Help us, oh God, to listen day by day. We are all living into so many afters this week. We are a week after Easter. Some of us are experiencing life after receiving a vaccination. Many of us are adjusting to new life after job changes and home changes and losing loved ones even. So God, we pray that for all the afters we are experiencing, that we would find new purpose with you, that you would be our guide, that we would settle ourselves down to listen to your call on our lives. And God, thank you that again and again you tell us failure is not the end of the story. It's actually the next invitation to new life with you. And thank you too, God, that you tell us that success is actually about growing in our relationship with you. It's about slowing ourselves down to serve those that cross our paths. It's about asking you how to love well. So, please God, help us to receive your Holy Spirit this day. Thank you for the incredible gift it is. Fill us again as together we pray the prayer your son taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to go now back out into the world to serve, a few reminders for you. First, I'll be at the hello spot. If you have any questions about what's coming up here at Wyzetta Community Church, or if you're new with us, come say hi, and I can answer those questions and welcome you in person. Second, just another reminder that our annual meeting will be online on Saturday, April 24th, and if you'd like instructions about how to join that meeting, you can watch our Inspire Weekly that comes out, or you can grab a postcard on the way out as well. Now let's stand and receive our closing hymn together.
the benediction, of course, we invite you to be seated and to receive the gift of music in a, in a postlude or to just linger in the space of God while you're here, lest we ever take this opportunity for granted again. So go now, refreshed by God, renewed by the Holy Spirit, and encouraged by the peace, the purpose, and the power of Christ. And as you go, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remake you from within. For what does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with our God? Amen.